Christian presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Good morning. Good to see you as we do continue the soap opera that is Judges, right? I'll remind you that uh, Judges, when we talk about Judges, we're not talking about uh, people that wear black robes with a gavel uh, deciding cases in a courtroom, but that we're talking about deliverers. And we've seen this cycle time and time again that Israel does evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord hands them over to an oppressor. Then the Israelites cry out, oh God, come and save us. So God sends a deliverer, a judge, to come and save them. And then the land has rest and the people have peace for so many years until it happens again and the cycle just continues and continues. Today we're in the middle of one of those cycles as we look into the Samson saga. So let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to gather together in your name, and that as we gather together, that you are here in our midst. I ask this morning, Lord, that as we look into this word, this word to us from judges, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would change our lives, that you would make us into the disciples that you're calling us to be. I ask, O oh God, that the words of my mouth, the meditations of each and every one of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. For you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. To you we give the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have great expectations for Samson. After all, an angel of the Lord had miraculously announced his birth to his barren mother and promised that he would begin to deliver Israel. And not only that, but this child would be specially set apart from God. He'll take the Nazarite vow as a sign of his cons cons yeah, concentration. consecration to God, he'll refrain from three things. He'll refrain from the fruit of the vine, he will avoid contact with any dead body, and thirdly, he will adhere to a strict no-haircut policy. We remember Fabio or something like that, right? Well, after the dazzling introduction of this wonder man, we anticipate seeing him in action. By the end of chapter 13, he was grown, and the Spirit was stirring him. The Israelites had been in bondage to the Philistines for 40 years, so surely it is time for some action. But the opening lines of chapter 14 catch us off guard. In Hebrew, the very first thing out of Samson's mouth is woman. That's going to be, come in handy here in a little bit, isn't it? Woman, literally. Woman, I saw in Timnah from the daughters of the Philistines. I saw a woman from the daughter of the Philistines in Timnah. What a way to introduce the adult Samson. Oh, daddy, have I seen a woman. So Samson tells his parents, I want to take a Philistine wife. Talk about sleeping with the enemy. His parents object to Samson's taste in women. They caution him not to take a wife from those uncircumcised people. Now, circumcision was the sign of the Lord's covenant with Israel. So Samson's choice violates not only his parents' wishes, but also God's command. God had commanded the Israelites not to take a wife from among their pagan neighbors. But the spoiled brat insists, her, get for me now, he says in Hebrew. Her, get for me now. And then Samson offers the revealing reason. Our translation read it this way. Get her because she pleases me. But a more literal translation says it this way. Get her for me because she is right in my eyes. She is right in my eyes. The narrator will use this same language to describe Israel's moral deterioration. You see, Samson is like all of Israel. He is doing what is right in his own eyes. Like Samson, Israel is supposed to be set apart as holy to the Lord. Like Israel pursuing foreign deities, Samson pursues Philistine beauties. You see, Samson's life gives us a mirror. In Samson's life, we see a picture of how the Israelites are living. Then in the story, there's a pause in the action. Then a narrator stops for a moment to inform us that the Lord is working through these events. Specifically, it says that the Lord was seeking a pretext or an opportunity to act against the Philistines. Behind the scenes, God is moving in Samson to start a conflict. The Lord is using Samuel's spiritually insensitive actions to accomplish divine purposes. 
Well, after that little footnote, the action resumes. Samson and his parents are going down to Timnah. Timnah, where the woman who Samson saw resides. So evidently, their attempt to persuade him not to marry a Philistine woman had obviously failed. At some point, Samson and his parents become separated, and a crisis occurs. A young lion suddenly comes roaring out at Samson. And I wanted to do the big roar thing, but I'm not very big, good at that. But then, just when that lion comes out, the Spirit of the Lord rushed on him, and Samson shows that lion who's boss. He tore the lion apart with his bare hands, the Bible says, as if it was a young goat. Evidently, goat tearing was common in those days. It's what you did on game nights in ancient Israel. What did you do for Labor Day? Oh, the usual. We had a picnic, played some cornhole, tore a few goats. But again, again the narrator pauses, this time to tell us that Samson didn't inform his mom or dad about the lion wrestling. Now, why wouldn't Samson tell him? Why wouldn't Samson reveal this to his parents? Well, did you notice the setting of this lion encounter? It happens in the vineyards of Timnah. The vineyards of Timnah. That should arouse our curiosity. Why is Samson near a vineyard? What about his Nazarite vow, which included abstaining from grapes and any grape-related products? Well, eventually Samson reaches his destination, and he talks with the woman, his dream woman, and the narrator reports that she pleased Samson. Literally, she was right in Samson's eyes. And Samson returns to marry this Philistine woman. But along the way, as he's making the journey to go up for his wedding, he sees the carcass of the lion that he had killed. Now that should raise a red flag. Just as we ask why Samson is near a vineyard, we must also wonder, what is Samson doing near a carcass? Will he violate his Nazarite vow? When Samson arrives at the carcass, he looks down and he sees a surprising sight. This carcass housed a community of bees. Now, ordinarily, we'd expect a carcass to be crawling with magnets. Uh, magnets, yeah. Maggots. Maggots or magnets, whatever. Samson disregards his Nazarite vow, and he touches the carcass. He scrapes honey into his hand, and he eats it. Mmm, good honey, good honey. And it's going all over his beard. And he even gives some to his parents. Once again, Samson has done what is right in his own eyes. And note the verbs in this passage. Note the choice of verbs. Three times in this opening scene, we read that Samson went down. Samson went down. Although that verb speaks of physical movement, it also re reflects the downward spiritual movement in Samson's life. Samson reflects Israel's downward spiral into evil and destruction. Again, Samuel is a picture of Israel as a whole. Well, Samson's father no, now goes down. He goes down to meet this woman that Samson plans to marry. Apparently, he needs to complete arrangements for Samson's wedding. And while he's getting all the arrangements ready, Samson, for his part of the wedding preparations, throws a feast at his Philistine fiancé's house. But this is not just any feast. The term feast in the Hebrew refers to a drinking party. So we have a man who's supposed to be a teetotaler organizing a keg party. Once again, Samson appears to violate his Nazarite vow. He's already touched the carcass, and now he's drinking wine. Anyway, Samson is at the party, and they get 30 Philistine people, and they say, you be Samson's friend. And so 30 companions come, and these new friends, uh, uh, Samson proposes a riddle. And this riddle is based on his contact with the honey-filled carcass. He challenges the Philistines. If they guess the answer, they win. If not, Samson wins. And the losing side will treat the winning side to expensive garments. Here's the riddle. From the eater comes out something to eat, and from the strong comes out sweetness. Three days pass. The companions, they have no clue. They are unable to guess the riddle. 
And so they threatened to burn Samson's wife and family. For the rest of the seven-day feast, Samson's wife weeps, and she claims, Samson, you don't love me. You must hate me because you don't tell me the meaning of the riddle. At first, Samson refuses. He says, I haven't even told my parents. But finally, he gives in. The Bible says he gives her the solution because she nagged him. We've all been there, haven't we, men? (laughs) I won't look that way. Just in the nick of time, on the seventh day before the sun went down, the Philistines show up and they provide the right answer. What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And Samson accuses them of cheating. If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Now I know, I know that Samson's upset, but I'm going to suggest that comparing his wife to a cow was not a very good idea. It's just as derogatory back then as it is today. Then he calls his wife a heifer. And then the Spirit of the Lord rushes on Samson. And Samson goes down once again, this time to Ashkelon, a major Philistine city. And there he kills 30 men because he needs garments, right? And so he takes those 30 men's garments to pay the winners who had solved his riddle. And we hope that's the end of that. Now for the honeymoon. Woo! Hardly. Samson's anger burned. And so he decides he's going to leave his wife behind for a while and return to his father's house. Instead of runaway bride, it's the runaway groom. He leaves, and so they assume he doesn't want his wife. And she then is given to his best man. But after a little time elapses, Samson's temper cools a bit. So he decides, I'm going to go down and make amends with my wife. He is obviously unaware that his wife has been given to his best man, Because Samson arrives for a visit, and he brings along a goat. A goat was the ancient equivalent of a box of chocolates. Walt, you should go home with a a goat someday. The time of the year is late May or, or early June, the time of the wheat harvest. Now, Samson has every intention of going into her room, and it wasn't to look at her scrapbook of wedding pictures, if you know what I mean. However, when Samson announces his intention to visit his wife and to go into his room, his father-in-law will not allow him to go in. Instead, his father-in-law offers a carefully reasoned explanation. And I really like the way the King James put it. I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Doesn't that just sound beautiful? I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her. Maybe she told him about the heifer comment. Anyway, this explains why he gave his daughter to the best man. But Samson has already paid a dowry or a bride price, and so the father-in-law's like, I got to do something for you, so let me offer you my younger daughter. He even tried to convince Samson with the claim that his younger daughter is prettier than the older one, and uh, so Samson should go for that. And I kind of expected Samson to accept the offer of the younger and the prettier sister, but he responds, thanks by no thanks. After all, no one tells Samson what to do. He blames the Philistines for what has happened, and they must pay for Samson losing his wife. And now, the narrator's reason for noting that it was the time of the wheat harvest becomes clear. Samson decides to torch the Philistines' fields and to destroy their harvest. And what an amazing way he goes about doing this. Somehow, I have no idea how he does this, but Samson captures 300 foxes. And not only does he capture that many foxes, but then he ties them tail to tail and attaches torches to them. He ties them in pairs rather than sending them out into the fields individually because he wants them to slow down as they move throughout the fields and make sure the fire spreads. And that's how Samson outfoxed the Philistines. That was a bad one. I'm sorry. (laughs) Samson and the Philistines trade acts of revenge. Even though the Philistines identify Samson as the culprit who burned their fields, they take revenge on his father-in-law and wife for his shenanigans. 
and they burn her and her father alive. Well, that triggers another burst of outrage from Samson. Samson completes a great slaughter. Philistines were stacked, leg upon thigh. The bodies just piled up. And Samson takes refuge from the Philistines in a cave. Samson is hardly living up to his calling. But the Lord's plan is actually taking shape. Ironically, the Lord uses Samson's anger and Samson's self-serving violence as an opportunity to act against the Philistines and to bring deliverance to Israel. Indeed, Samson's conflict with the Philistines escalates to the point of war. This personal vendetta waged over a woman explodes into an international conflict. Because in response to the field torching incident, the Philistines take military action. They make a raid into Israelite territory into the tribe of Judah. And they explain the reason for their aggression to the men of Judah. The reason is, is that they have come into Israelite territory because they want to take revenge on Samson. So in order to maintain peace with the Philistines, which is amazing in and of itself that Israelites want to maintain peace with the Philistines, the men of Judah go and they search for Samson. When they find him, the first thing the men of Judah ask him is, Samson, why are you ticking off the Philistines? And Samson replies, as they did to me, so I have done to them. Note that. As they did to me, so I have done to them. This is a good description of what life is like when everyone does what is right in their own eyes. As they did to me, so I have done to them. It's the anti-golden rule. The Samsonite code is, what's right in my eyes I do, and do unto others as they have done unto you. But Jesus' code is different. Jesus' code is do to others as you would have them do to you. But because Samson, because Samson lives by his code instead of Jesus' code, the vicious cycle spirals out of control. These acts of revenge, which have nothing at all to do with Samson's dedication to God and which show no concern for the welfare of his nation, are both self-perpetuating and snowballing. The Philistines have come to catch and bind Samson. And the Philistines did that because Samson has slaughtered many of them. And he did that because they burned his wife and his father alive. And they did that because he build, burned their fields and grain. But he did that because his father-in-law had given away his wife. But his father-in-law had done that because Samson had abandoned her in rage. But he did that because his Philistine wife had abandoned him. But she did that because the Philistines threatened her household with death. But they did that because Samson was out to make them look foolish with a crazy riddle. The escalation of violent acts, one upon another, one upon another, just goes on and on and on. This story is all about revenge. And when people are motivated by revenge, there is no end to the cycle of violence. There is no end. When I am about whatever you do to me, I'm going to do back to you. It just keeps going and going and going. So how will we end this cycle how will we end this cycle it's human nature it's the story of humanity from the beginning what you do to me I do to you I'm going to get you back and as we will see this cycle continues throughout Samson's story but at this point Samson surrenders to the men of Judah he allows them to bind him with two new ropes being new means that these ropes were strong and the Judahites take Samson back to where the Philistines had set up camp. And as soon as the Philistines see him, they start shouting at him. And boom goes the dynamite. All of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord rushed on Samson. And he was enabled to break the ropes, the Bible says, as if they were charred fibers weakened by fire. And Samson ferociously fights the Philistines. He finds a fresh jawbone of a donkey. He reached down. He took this jawbone. He wielded it like a club, and he killed a thousand men. 
Now, the fact that this jawbone is fresh is significant. It provided a weapon that was not uh, brittle, but even more significantly, we realize that Samson has once again broken his Nazarite vow. He has taken his weapon from the corpse of a donkey. But miraculously, the Lord is still accomplishing his purposes through Samson. Well, Samson celebrates his victory with an outburst of poetry. With the jawbone of an ass, I have piled them in a mass. I took the jawbone of an ass, and I had a blast. And then he drops the jawbone like he's dropping the mic. But the episode isn't over. In a final scene, Samson calls out to the Lord to quench his thirst, lest he fall exhausted into enemy hands. You see, Samson had to admit his need for the Lord's intervention in order to survive. And for the first time in Samson's life, and the first time in the story, Samson speaks to the God who has chosen him and empowered him. But you notice this prayer? It is neither humble nor faithful. Samson basically demands that God helps him and complains that God doesn't help him, which is remarkably clueless of him because it was God's spirit who had rescued him from a lion, from a lost bet, and from a thousand Philistines. Yet the Lord graciously responds to Samson's prayer. God splits open a hollow place in a rock so that water gushed out from it. And after being revived by the Lord's provision, the refreshed Samson led Israel for 20 years. What a story. How can God use such flawed people People like Samson to get his work done. Shouldn't God only work with people who are good, godly men and women? Shouldn't God only use the people who have the right beliefs and the right behavior? The problem with this is that it puts God in a box. It would mean that God is limited by humans and is allowed only to work when people are being good and making godly choices. It would mean that God does not work by grace, taking the initiative to save, but that God works in response to good works, waiting for people to help him to save. Scholar David Jackman describes how Judges shoots holes through all of this. Judges, he writes, is above all a book about grace, undeserved mercy. That is not to play down theological accuracy or to pretend it doesn't matter how we behave. We will still suffer from our sins. But we can rejoice, Jackman says, that God is also in the business of using our failures as the foundations for his success. Let us never imagine that we have God tapped or that we know how God will work or win. As soon as we start to say, God cannot or will not until we are wrong-footed. The amazing truth is that God works through sinners and through sinful situations. God keeps his promises to bless his people in the dark and disastrous periods of our lives as well as through the times when things are going right. Mysteriously, often unseen, and usually far beyond our comprehension, God works through the free and often very flawed choices that people make. But not even our sin, not even our sin will stop God from saving us or from using us. And because of that, I say, amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this scripture from the book of Judges and the story of Samson. And we thank you, God, for what it teaches what it teaches us about ourselves, and what it teaches us about you. Lord, although Samson seems a little bit out of control, we admit that we see a lot of ourselves in Samson. We see people in our world, Lord, who are bent on doing what is right in their own eyes rather than what is good for you and what is good for others. Samson lived all about his code, his code of, I will do to you what you did to me, revenge, and I will get you back. And it was a a, a never-ending cycle. 
But Lord Jesus, you call us to live in another way. You call us to live through the golden rule, the rule that Jesus gave us to treat others as we would want to be treated and even as they would want to be treated. And Lord, I thank you that you show us how to break that cycle of revenge. But we admit, God, that we are often flawed, that we are often Samson's. And God, I thank you for the assurance that even when we mess up, even when we sin, it does not mean that you are unable to work, that you can still work and you can still use flawed and sinful human beings and flawed situations. Lord, despite the bad choices that we make, you are still at work bringing about your plans and your purposes. And we thank you, God, for that assurance. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We brought the story of honor and glory and praise the name of Christ. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.